Good morning, Richfield Life. It's a joy to be with you today. I want to make you aware of a couple announcements we have for this week. The first thing is we want to remind you that elder nominations are open right now. These are the men who are called by God to lead his church. And we have um, information about that in your bulletin, but the most important thing is if this is something that you're considering or if you know of someone who you believe would be a good candidate for elder, we encourage you to make that request known to the elders. And you can email the elders or talk to one of the elders on the nominating committee. But all this information can be found in the bulletin. The next thing we have is next week we have a vote by the congregation which will be held during the worship services. This vote is for the associate children's director position. It's a vote of affirmation to create the position. Teresa Schaefer um, is who the elders have in mind for this position and there will be a meet and greet held tonight this evening in our fellowship hall for her and Josh Thompson who is the candidate for the youth director position. So this will be a time where we get to meet and greet um, these two candidates, but also with the position and the vote that we have coming up, this will be a time that we give space for the congregation to ask information, to ask questions about information um, for the position and just the vision behind it, some of the details of it, and just to bring clarity for everyone to be informed for the vote. One other thing we want to make you aware of is a couple service opportunities. Um, we have every Wednesday evening we have a WANA program, which is an opportunity we have to impact the kids of our generation, a lot of who come to our church, but a lot of who come from outside our neighboring communities here. And this is a time that we have to teach them sound biblical instruction and guide them, but give them a space to have fun and to get to know each other and get to know the leaders. And we're looking for a few more people to be substitutes in this. If this is something that you'd be interested in doing, we ask that you talk to Ashley Scholl or Oscar Strasser about more information on how to do that. And contact information is available at the welcome centers and in the bulletins. And also, we want to make you aware that OCC season, Operation Christmas Child season, is coming up. Next week, there are several opportunities to get involved, and these are all listed in the bulletin, as well as next week during Sunday school, we will be having a packing party for all the kids to help pack shoe boxes in our fellowship hall. So that's all the announcements for today. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to a great worship service. Well, we welcome you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, God bless you for coming out this morning. It felt a little more like fall this morning, didn't it? But uh, I guess we should be thankful for that. The seasons are changing, the leaves are turning, and uh, so we just uh, thank you for coming out this morning. Let's, op let's all stand, and we're going to open a word of prayer, and then we'll sing our hymns this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Lord, we seek your presence among us today. Lord, as we sing, as we pray, as we worship you together, and as Aaron brings the message you have laid on his heart, we just ask, Lord, that in all things you would be glorified. So bless our time together today, and Lord, just minister to those who could not be with us this morning. Lord, just uh, speak to their hearts, whether they're having devotions at home by themselves or watching something on TV or, or uh, watching our services online. We just, uh, Lord, we, we seek that you would be glorified in, in all ways of worship this morning, and so bless them as well. So guide us now as we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our first song this morning is Crown Him with Many Crowns. I think it's a song you know very well. Or in between the third and the fourth verse, there is a brief uh, key change. And uh, so just follow along. Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown Him with Many Crowns. Oh, my soul. 
ask you to be seated for a second here. <clears throat> I'm going to read Psalms chapter 90. If you want to open your Bibles to that, you may. This is not the pastor's sermon, but our next song was written by Isaac Watts. And he wrote this song after contemplating and studying Psalms 90. It says, Lord, you have been my dwell, our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight is like, are like yesterday when it is past. And like a watch in the night, you carry them away like a flood. They are like sheep. In the morning, they are like grass, which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and, flourishes and grows up. And in the evening, it's cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger and your wrath. We are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days, you have passed, have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are like 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are for 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years which we have seen evil. Let the, your work appear in your servants and your glory to their children, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let's all stand and sing 688, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. And I'm sorry if you have trouble getting up and down this morning. Just please, please be seated. So.
It's not too often we sing a song with six verses, but they're short verses. And uh, uh, if you were paying attention to Psalms 90 and you were listening to the words as you sang them, there's a lot of similarity there. <clears throat> if you're able to kneel this morning, we're going to go to prayer. If not, uh, you can remain seated. But let's worship the Lord through our prayer this morning. God, we praise you again today for allowing us to be in your presence. We thank you, O oh God, for the work that you have done in each of our hearts. And Lord, this morning we come to you as unworthy children who, as we just sang, our time on earth is, is but a a fainting moment in the reality of eternity, but yet you have called us for this time to be your children, and we give you the glory and the praise for that. So, Lord, we just thank you that your mercy and your grace has been showered upon us and who have called us to be your children, and we thank you for the work that you are doing in each of our lives. Lord, we, we must admit and we ask for your forgiveness because we all fail in many ways. Lord, we are sinful people who, who want to run to sin way too often. But God, we praise you that you have promised your children can come to you and cry out to you and repent from our ways and ask you, Lord, for your cleansing and your forgiveness. And you are there for us. And we worship you because you are a loving God and an everlasting loving God who, who, who cares about his children. So we thank you for that this morning. Lord, we praise you for the, the work of, that goes on within the walls of this ministry here at Richfield. Lord, we pray that you would just continue to draw people to yourself through the teaching of your word, that children in our WANA programs might come to know you as their Savior, that as they're exposed to the gospel. Lord, we thank you for, Lord, just the, all the Bible studies and for the ministries that go on within our walls and in our homes. And Lord, we just, Lord, it's easy to be discouraged sometimes about the world and, the, and things that we hear on the news, but Lord, help us to focus on you. Keep our minds and our hearts stayed on you because you are our hope. So we give you glory and we give you praise for all this. We just ask God that you would just continue to minister to those among us who are hurting. Lord, continue the healing process for those who have had surgeries. And Lord, for those who are battling COVID and other sicknesses, we just ask God that you would be near to them and provide healing and strength. Lord, for your honor and for your glory, and we worship you because we know that you are the great provider. So, Lord, as we come into this time of our, our worship today where we look to you to hear from your word, I just ask, God, that you would open each of our hearts, that you would minister to us through your servant, Aaron. And, God, we just praise you for what you are doing. Lord, just thank you for your rich blessings to this church and to the, our community and those uh, around us, Lord, we praise you for the opportunity to give to you, and we just ask that you would continue to provide for the needs of the church and for the needs of uh, even our wants as we desire to to build a new church. And God, we just I ask for your hand of grace to sh just wow us with with who with your blessing as we seek your face in this area. So God, we just praise you for all things in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Thank you, Brian, for leading us in worship here this morning. This morning, as we get started in John chapter 13, I want to ask you a question. What do you do uh, when you see good things in others? What do you do with that as a person? Uh, if you see someone have zeal, do you, do you admire that zeal? Do you recognize that good things come from above? Um, 
When you see someone that has a certain ability, do you, do you kind of just go, oh, well, they have that ability, I don't? I want you to be thinking about that. What do you do when you see others do something that is good and is for God? Because in one hand, as believers, we all know that in this room, we're varied believers, right? The, the scriptures make that clear, that we're a body. And in this room, there's lots of different gifts and testimonies and talents and we know that God endows us with spiritual gifts to be able to do certain things. And then at the same time, Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, says that we should all be earnestly desiring three gifts. So that's unique, isn't it? God distributes gifts, and then yet we're all commanded by God twice, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31 and 1 Corinthians 14, 1, to earnestly desire the greater gifts. And that's kind of, that's unique. We're a body, and yet God's asking us to strive forward. In the same way, we're here today under a banner, and it's a banner that we all wear. It's the banner called Christian. And by default, that means every person in this room is adamantly, I pray, following Jesus Christ, meaning they do more than just mentally assent, more than just go, I believe the Bible's true, this is true, and shake their head, but that it transforms their life, right? That's why Jesus says, you must be born again, meaning that as believers, we are not just faithful people in a sense, but we're transformed. We're changed. Romans chapter 12, in fact, says this, right? I beseech you therefore, church, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, and be ye being transformed, metamorphosized. It's the word there, transformed, is where we get the word for what happens to a, better, a butterfly, metamorphosis. And so that means that in really in a certain way, the people I'm talking to this week are not the same people I talked to last week. Isn't that cool? That no one in this room is the same. Now, you may feel the same. You may feel stuck. But even being stuck, you're not stuck. <laughs> you're different. And I think sometimes we live in a society that teaches us to admire people. Uh, think, oh, that's good for them. You know, wow, they're amazing. And, and leave it at that. But not ask the questions, how did they become amazing? What kind of commitment did they have to make? Right? We watch things like sports and Olympics and plays and people write books and we just think, oh, well, they're just, they just have it. Most people that do those things don't just have it. They developed it. They worked at it. I watched a guy on TikTok who showed the progression of his art. I was totally memorized by this gentleman. His early stuff, I was amazed by his early stuff already. I'm thinking, I've never been able to draw that well. Um, but amazingly, as time went on, his stuff got more and more and more beautiful to the point that I literally can't distinguish the difference between a drawing he has and a photo. Literally, his photo, they're pencil drawings. His pencil drawings are so good that you cannot distinguish the difference between those and photos. And so this morning, that question of what do we do with people that we see do great things? What do you do with that? Because if you're, if you're merely an admirer, you're, you're in a bad spot. Or if you're in a place where you think, oh, that's good for them, but not for me, you're in a bad spot. And at the same time, if we think, right, well, I can do anything anyone else does, and we think that it just happens, you're also in a bad spot. There needs to be this balance of realizing that our very Bible says, I can do most things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Did I get it right? I didn't, did I? I messed up a word. What was the word? All, right? Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. We all know the word says all, but in all seriousness, do we think that all the time? And when I say think that, I mean live that. You can't think it and not live it as a Christian. And so today we're faced with this premise that we are called Christians, meaning we imitate Christ. And we believe this with our whole heart, that we are saved by him, therefore we imitate him. And we encounter a passage that if you've been in this church for most of your life, you practice this in the past, you used to practice it at least twice a year, foot washing. And in our society, it's kind of lost its kind of flavor. And at the same time, if we're honest, very few of us want to practice it. <laughs> we have cleaner feet than almost any generation ever before. And uh, I'm not picking. I don't care. I, don't, I truly don't care that most people don't participate in foot washing. But it's still ironic to me that we don't. You don't have to do it to be saved. It's not like a sacrament of, of the church or anything like that. But, it, but it's a very interesting observation that we live in a time where 
more than likely, almost all of us have come here with clean feet. More than likely, we have clean socks. We have shoes on that cover our entire foot. And yet, we're like, well, I'm grossed out by feet, right? And yet, we, we have a guy that we imitate. And that guy, again, is Christ. And in his day, they didn't have shoes and they didn't have socks. They had cake-dusted feet. They probably had stuff growing on them, right? Maybe even different colored toenails. I don't know. And this is the Savior of the world. This is God in the flesh. This is King of kings and Lord of lords. And he gets in on the floor and wants to demonstrate servanthood and humility. And we have to ask ourselves in the world today, we recognize that foot washing may not be the primary means in which we can serve people, but it's funny when we as Christians have the opportunity to symbolically do it, we don't even want to do it symbolically. So as of our lack of willingness to even symbolically serve one another, at all evidence of our overall lack of desire to serve one another. Because I'll be the first to admit, I'll serve people that I like. I'll serve people that agree with me. But don't ask me to serve Judas. Judas. Don't ask me to serve somebody that I heard just a minute ago was going to betray me, right? Don't be ridiculous. That's what we would say. And yet, that's what the entire passage here is coming about is because I remind you back in 12, just a moment ago, literally about a day ago in the timeline of this whole event, people were shouting, Hosanna, God save us, and they were calling Jesus the King of Israel. And so here we pick it up in John chapter 13, looking for a picture to imitate, a man to follow. And we see in these first six verses a sign of things to come. We see that Jesus is kind of foreshadowing a work that's going to happen on the cross. And that's what happens right away in verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And I want you to pay attention to that word it, it, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The tenth word is Jesus knew. He already knew what was going to happen. He already had an idea, more than an idea. He had a very clear idea that he would suffer, and he had a very clear idea that he'd be portrayed. Before he ever even got to this moment, he went into this room knowing, I'm going to suffer. I'm not just going to die. Right? It wasn't enough for Jesus to die. He had to suffer. He had to be made a fool. He had to be shamed. He had to be mocked. He had to be disfigured to the point that he was unrecognizable. He knew this. Did that make Jesus' suffering any less? <laughs> By no means. And I think sometimes we think, if I could just know the who, the what, the when, the where, the high, if I could just have all the answers to my questions, suffering would be so much easier. That's a lie. Jesus knew everything, and it didn't diminish his suffering. God wasn't looking to the fact of whether Jesus knew all the answers. What was the Heavenly Father looking to? Was my son, Jesus Christ, going to be obedient or not? Jesus could have had all the answers. Yep, I'm supposed to die on the cross. Yep, yep, Judas is going to betray me. I know it. All right, Father, I showed you. I passed the test. I wrote all the answers down. That wasn't good enough, was it? He had to go the whole way. And and I think as Christians in our culture, we have to latch on to this, that answers are not enough. To know that we're supposed to suffer is not enough. We must be willing to suffer. Despite knowing the fact that, well, this person's going to do this and this person's going to do that. And I think sometimes we almost psych ourselves out of serving as Christ has served. And I think we often think that's for someone else. And yet we're called what again? Christians. Which means what? Little Christs. And we are so lured into the world that we think comfort is a circumstance. We think comfort is air conditioning. We think comfort is pews and padded pews. And we think comfort is having the food we like. We are fools. That's not comfort. The whole world has that. What the world doesn't have? Knowing they're going to suffer and having peace. Knowing they're going to suffer and have joy. Knowing they're going to suffer and be okay with it. See, we don't have to fight it because we know it's going to come. And yet we're foolish enough to do what? Kick against it and try to not suffer. When Jesus Christ, our own Savior, says, uh, heads up, look at how they treated me. 
get ready. How do you think they're going to treat you? And it just, it, it, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but it just shocks me that Christians are shocked by what's happening in the world. I'm like, don't take this the wrong way, but how are you shocked? And this is my point. Knowing the answer doesn't help you. <laughs> Knowing the answer doesn't necessarily bring obedience. And this is where we have fallen in, I believe, to a mental assenting of Christianity that we think when we know the answer, that is sufficient when our God clearly says, no, 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 I'm not looking for the right answer, I'm looking for obedience. Do you act like Jesus in the face of suffering? That's the question. And we may see others have joy, we may hear of other Christians in other nations singing while they're persecuted, and we may think, well, that's good for them, that's good for them, and then when our, our order at our restaurant's wrong, or gas goes up in cost, or the cashier messes something up, or our doctor screws our medicine up, or something small happens, our kid gets cheated at a game, we, we totally lose it. And yet here's Jesus Christ saying, oh no, I'm going to love my own to the very end. In the very next verse it says, so what happened was during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And you see there on your notes that knowing beforehand does not necessarily do away with suffering. Jesus knew who, Jesus knew what, Jesus knew when, but it didn't decrease the amount of suffering that he had. I think there's people in this room that we want to know, why am I suffering? Why is my family member sick? Why did somebody die? Why is this happening in our nation? Why is our president acting this way? Why do abortions abound? They're fair questions to ask God. But even if you had the answer, it wouldn't diminish the suffering. It was never intended to. The only thing that can diminish the suffering, the only thing that can ease our pain is something that man can't give. Man can't prescribe it. No doctor can help it. It's the only thing that can come through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is forgiveness, which is the Holy Spirit. See, we're told the Holy Spirit is called comforter, and yet if we're brutally honest, I think if we take a long, hard look at our soul and we would say, Father, when I suffer, do I actually look to your Holy Spirit? Do I actually cry out, Father, comfort me? Or do I turn on the TV? Do I pick up a pointless book? Do I call a friend who isn't Jesus? See, Jesus, where, where did he turn? He turned to his father, knowing that his father had given him all things, knowing that he was going back to his father. And we see that serving those who hate you is the very distinguishing mark of being a Christian. These verses make it clear that Satan had already put it in the heart of Judas. And I'm going to be clear. Verse 2, if you're looking in your notes there, there are so many different variants on that verse. Oh man, there are so many different perspectives. But this I can tell you. It is clear that Satan's involved and it's clear that Judas is involved. And it's clear that Judas on the surface just thinks, hey, no big deal. I'm just making a quick buck. All right? No big deal. Nothing bad will happen to Jesus, right? Because that's what we think. When we're tempted by sin, sin doesn't tell you, oh, by the way, when this is all said and done, I will have dragged you through the streets, stripped you naked, and beaten you unrecognizably. Sin just goes, it's just 30 bucks. Hey, it's just one morning not with God. Hey, everyone else is zealous. You, don't, don't make yourself uncomfortable. I mean, that guy can act like an idiot, but you don't have to. And yet, Scripture says, let your love be zealous. I am zealous. Yep, I'm as excited about Jesus as I am everything else. Really? Man, I've seen people in our community get angry 
That's excitement. Whether you like it or not, it's negative excitement, but it's excitement. And many of you may say, I'm not an excitable person. I ask you, do you get angry? Do you ever get angry? How angry do you get? How offended do you get? Anyone here get offended? I bet you do. So you know how to practice negative excitement, negative zeal. God's not blind to this. He sees that you can get angry about things you don't like. But what's he looking for? Get excited about the things he likes, which is his son. And see, this is how the devil does it. He says, no big deal. You can be zealous about other things. You can be passionate about government. You can be passionate about pre uh, uh, presidents. You can be passionate about the economy. You can, yeah, yeah. And then when it comes to Jesus, oh, I I'm excited. Uh-huh. And God's not mocked. This is something I had to learn a long time ago. See, I knew at a young age, God saw how hard and mo how passionately I was willing to serve money. I was faithful. I show up on time every time. And when I'm asked to work extra, I do it. And then it's funny, when it comes all of a sudden to God, when God says, yes, yeah, seek me in the morning. I'm a little tired, God. Isn't that funny how that works? I bet you're a lot like me where you would never dream, not once, of being late to work. But to serve God by knowing Him, to serve God by having a passionate and intimate relationship with Him, mm, He won't mind if I'm late. Will your boss mind? I bet he would. Do you think God minds? I bet he does. It's no different than if Nicole saw me being romantic with all other women. I say, oh, babe, don't worry about it. You're the special one. There'd come a point in time where my wife would have enough. She would say, you better be kidding me, Benner. Taking all these other people on dates. You're not taking me on a date? No, no, you know I love you the most, though. What's Nikki saying? You're out of your mind. And the thing is, church, if we're honest, I think if we take a moment and hit the pause button, we might see that that's exactly what we do with our father. You ever see that in your life? Never late for work, but late to spend time with him. Never late to complain about what we don't like, but late to thank him for what we do. And see, this is where the gospel comes into play because Jesus knows Judas is going to betray him, and yet he doesn't say, well, I know he's going to betray me, so therefore I won't serve him. The passage makes it clear. It is the epitome of the cross. See, this is what's happening, is Jesus is preparing his disciples for the cross. And we see that in this clarity, Satan absolutely hates all things Christian. Hates it. He'll do whatever he can. But the reality is, is Jesus' royalty, servanthood was his job, and intimacy with his father was his power. And as verse 7 continues, Jesus answered him and said, what I am doing, you don't now understand. There's a, there's a truth, isn't it? Anyone looking around the world today going, I have no clue what God is up to. That's me. <laughs> Every morning I wake up and I say, Lord, I'm just going to start the day off with saying, I have no idea what you're up to. I would like to know, and if you're willing to share, I'm all ears, but I also recognize that I'm kind of stubborn, and I'm also kind of arrogant, and even if you told me what you were doing, chances are I wouldn't believe you anyhow, because I'd be like, well, that's not what you're doing, and he would be like, no, that's what I'm doing, and then I'd argue with him, and it would just be a mess. Anyone else ever do that? <laughs> the Lord makes it clear what he's doing finally, and you're like, well, no, no, that can't be what you're doing, and he's going, no, that, that's, see, I told you, Aaron, I told you that if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe me anyhow. Oh, yeah, you're right, Lord. <laughs> Thank you for humbling me. And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing now, you do not understand now. But afterward, you'll understand. Hindsight is 20, 20 isn't it? When, it? when we're willing to be honest. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet, Lord. This is like a, an unthinkable thing. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was about to betray him, and that is why he said not all of you is clean. And what we see here is that Jesus is giving them a heads up. He's saying, I recognize that what I'm doing, you don't understand. I see that. But don't, don't, 
be panicked about it. But what he wants to make clear to Peter in verse 8 is Peter's saying, whoa, 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 what Jesus is doing is so unthinkable. The fact that the Messiah, the Son of God, the one that we believe is the Christ, would get down on his hands and knees and wash my feet? No, 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 no. But here's, I want you to see the grace of God in this. This is all preparing them for the unfathomable work of the cross. If the disciples and we couldn't accept the fact that Jesus, I mean, seriously, I don't know if you're much of a creative thinker, but I'd almost for a moment like you to create an image in your head where Jesus walks right in these doors, stoops right down where you're at, takes your shoes off, and starts to wash your feet. What would you do? What would you say? I bet some of you would have feelings of shame, I'm not worthy, might be thinking about crap that happened this week that shouldn't have happened. Words that you said you shouldn't have said. Thoughts you said you shouldn't have had. Maybe even actions you took to deny him. A little spoiler alert. By the end of this chapter, Jesus, the very guy that's saying, uh, don't just wash my head, wash the whole thing. By the end of the chapter, Jesus says, oh, by the way, uh, my excited one, you're going to deny me, but that's not a problem for me. God prophetically foretells Peter, oh, you'll deny me, but don't, your denial doesn't make you not mine. See, if Jesus would stoop down in front of every person in this room and wash their feet, we would have lots of reasons why we think that shouldn't be happening and the roles should be reversed. But before you can even worry about serving him, you have to, in your soul, let him serve you. If you're serving him, not letting him serve you, you're doing it out of panic. You're doing it out of thinking, I'm not worthy. Stop saying that. And I'm not trying to preach some self-help gospel here, but if the Lord of the world died on the cross for you, then that's the value of you. And you must be apparently pretty valuable because Satan won't let you alone day and night. And if an enemy won't let you alone day and night, that puts a certain value on you, doesn't it? So much so that the Savior of the world said, I must show you. I must clean you. And Jesus makes it clear to Peter that if you are not cleansed by Jesus, you are not a child of God. And as Jesus does this, Jesus used this shameless act to prepare the way to the cross. Right? Isn't it weird how in one sense we just become so knowledgeable, so intelligent that we're like, yep, yep, Jesus died on the cross, hip, hip, hooray. And yet, if he was to come in and wash your feet right now, most of us would pull the same scene as Peter and go, whoa, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> right, we'd be so caught up theologically. I thought you were supposed to come with a trumpet. <laughs> we'd try to impress him with our theology. And Jesus would be like, no, no, I'm just coming to try to serve you right now. Isn't that weird that we're saying we can accept the cross, but we can't accept him washing our feet? <laughs> but that's exactly what he did, that... He tried to prepare the disciples as he's preparing us for his return. And Jesus said, I will use this act of washing their feet to get them ready for the more unfathomable act of the cross. And unfortunately, Jesus is trying to make the message clear here. He's saying, look, if I don't clean you, you can have any part of me. And Peter's totally missing it, just like they totally missed the cross, which is never a problem for God. And this is an absolute shameless act. It is totally countercultural. It is against everything that these men grew up with. It makes absolutely no human sense. But the best part of all is that it reveals that sinful actions can never hinder a sinless God. Can't happen. Listen very carefully to that. It is point C under point two, two C. Sinful actions cannot hinder a sinless God. As you survey the world today, I understand that there is a great temptation to magnify the sin of the world. Listen, it doesn't need to be magnified. It simply is. The Scriptures say that the world is servants of Satan's, children of the prince of the power of the air. So their sin of the world is not a surprise. They're doing exactly what they've always done, and they're doing what they always will do. 
And from the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve sinned, sin wasn't a problem for God. Before the foundation of the world, God already had a plan. And whether you like that or not, some of you get funny about predestination stuff, but you have to take it up with the Bible. <laughs> Ephesians says that before the foundation of the world, God had a plan for our sin. And all the crap that's happened in the world today, Satan wants you to think that this perfect and almighty God is getting caught off guard. That's a lie. Because here in this moment, Judas and Satan thought they had a good thing going. Judas thought, I'm going to make a quick buck. And Satan thought, finally, get rid of this guy. Once again, I, refer, I remind you of the Lazarus miracle, the insanity of the world, right? Let's kill Lazarus so Jesus can raise him again, you morons. <laughs> You're idiots. I mean, Satan here is a real idiot right? Jesus Christ has already revealed he has the power of the resurrection. So what's Satan say? Well, let's kill him. And God's going, <laughs> okay, <laughs> it'll just make him even greater. And yet the disciples, they couldn't fathom such a plan, could they? They were thinking, Jesus is dead? <gasps> and yet that's the very thing that God used to bring the greatest glory. And here in this moment, many of us would think that if someone sold us out for 30 pieces of silver, Many of us would think, oh no, world governments are collapsing. Oh no, we have corrupt presidents. Oh no. And God's going, they're fools. How many times does God have to show us they're fools? Sinful actions will never hinder a sinless God. We've got to learn this. Otherwise, the world will make us anxious. It'll rob us of our desire to serve them. That's the other thing. When we think that they're so corrupt, it makes you feel justified to not serve them, doesn't it? You think, they don't deserve my service, and yet I remind you, who, who was Jesus washing again? Whose feet? Judas's? The very one that Satan had put in his heart to sell him out? And as the passage continues, Jesus makes the message clear. He, he clarifies what and why he was doing. And he said to them, after he had washed their feet, and put, verse 12, and put on the outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, right? He said, I'm up here. You think I'm up here. And you're right. It's true. I am your teacher and I am your Lord. For so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Do you hear what Jesus is saying here? Is he, is he really after saying literally wash feet? Is, is that the focus? Or is there kind of this underlying message here? Is there something more than just, yeah, yeah, let's, let's wash feet when we have communion. No, that's just a symbol. What Jesus is after is he's saying, truly, truly, listen to me. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you, what? Do them. Right there's the crux. Many of us here today know that we should be serving the Judases in our life. God's not asking whether you know it. What's he asking? Do you? I will be the first to admit that I often feel totally justified that if I think someone's going to take advantage of me or betray me, to not serve them. One of the hardest things in the world as a pastor, just being transparent for a moment here, is to know that there's people, because people that talk to people talk to people. <laughs> And they'll say things about you. And they don't know the half of anything, but they love to talk about it. And they'll say this and they'll say that. And then as their pastor, God says, now go love them. Lord, do you know what they said? Yeah, I know what they said. I heard it too. I know now that you heard it too, Aaron. See, knowing, knowing doesn't make it any better. <laughs> And it really should make all of us take a moment and hit the pause button and say, if Jesus Christ could serve Judas and he knew he was going to sell him out, 
why, why am, do I feel so justified to serve difficult people? See, Satan is literally robbing. It's, it's the very thing here that Christ is saying, look, do this, serve just like me. Because what we realize is when radical service done joyfully happens, it will always point people to Jesus. Why? Because the only reason we're doing it is because Jesus did it. It's because we actually believe Jesus did this, and we actually believe he meant for those who know these things, do them. We don't do it because we're like, oh, I can't wait to serve Judas. Listen, Jesus Christ bawled his eyes out in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was not for lack of suffering or hurt or pain. Jesus did not wait for a convenient moment. Jesus did not wait for all people to like him before he started serving. Jesus was in the garden saying, you've got to be kidding me, God. He was just being honest. And in the end, he said, what though? But I'll, I'll do what you want because it's what you want. It doesn't mean that we have to be so hyper-spiritual that we walk around and go, oh, I love suffering. Oh, I love serving Judas's. Oh, I love blessing those who curse me. It's so fun. Are you kidding me? Jesus never acted that way. But he did it. And do we, do we really see, do we really believe that radical service done joyfully? And there's, there's the key word. The scripture says what? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Not for the misery, not for the obedience, not because God said so. It, in the end was what? For the joy. What was the joy? To do his father's will. And it makes you wonder, is that our joy? Is our joy to actually do the Father's will, or is our joy circumstantial? Because if your joy is circumstantial, you won't do this. It won't happen. I don't mean to be mean, and I don't mean to be blunt, but plain and simple, if your joy is not the glory of God, you will not serve others radically. You will find every avenue out, an excuse out. Service is not something we endure on this earth so we can learn and earn the right to live in the celestial kingdom. Service is the very fiber of the kingdom of God. For Christ came not to be served, Mark 10, 45, but to give, to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Philippians chapter 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, became a slave. And this slave was willing to be obedient to the point of death. Yes, death on a cross. See, it's one thing we say, oh, I'll serve you, but don't threaten my life. Is that what Jesus said? I'll serve you, but don't threaten my life? It's not what he said, is it? It's not what he even thought. <laughs> and so we must see that radical service done joyfully points others to Christ, and it's the very fiber of the kingdom of Christ. The irony of serving, though, is that we are to serve those who are closest. Who's Jesus washing feet? He's not washing the community's feet. He's washing those who are closest to him, which in this instance, and for you in this room, is the hardest thing to do. There's nobody that has the ability to get under my skin better than Nicole Benner. She just, she's talented, and I love her to bits. But it doesn't take much. You know, people can say all sorts of things to me, church people. We don't like this. And actually, that doesn't even happen that much. But I'm just saying for point of emphasis, you know, you, you could tell me you hate this whole morning. You know, Aaron, that's the worst sermon you've ever preached. And I'd be like, oh, thanks for that input. Nicole said that to me, World War III. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest. I'd be like, what? I How could you? What are you? I'd be exasperated, right? And that's the irony, isn't it? That's the beauty of this moment as Jesus is serving those who are closest to him and the one of these who are closest to him is one, the people that handled his money. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I want to tick somebody off, mess around with their money. Judas. So this dude's robbing from the money box. This is Jesus' money. He's robbing from the money box and he's selling Jesus out for more money and Jesus says what? Can I wash your feet? I serve you? That's wild, isn't it? That's supernatural. <laughs> There's not a single human being alive that would do that if they didn't have Jesus as the example. No one in their right mind prior to Jesus would do this. No one. Only the Son of God 
so focused on God could do such an insane thing. And what we realize is when we serve those who are closest, one, we realize we must serve God where we are or we won't serve God anywhere. I've seen that time and time again. People say, well, I can't, these people frustrate me, so I'm not going to serve here. But I can serve over here. You're, you're not actually serving over there. You're doing it for self-glorification. You're doing it for self. If you can't serve where you are, you can't serve anywhere. Don't be fooled. Men and women, especially those who are married, that means it starts in our homes. Why is it, when I was doing student teaching, and I was in a room full of nutcase second graders, which I loved, I fit right in, but I will be honest, there were many a days that, whew, and I could just exude patience with them. I could put up with all of their shenanigans and smarty pantsness and energy, and I come home, and Nicole does one little thing, one little thing. <clears throat> Isn't that weird? Gentlemen will go to work, and our bosses will boss us around. This is what I want you to do, when I want you to do it, how I want you to do it. Ah, cap. Wife comes home, I'd like you to help with dinner. Blah! Freak out, right? Ladies, you know the same's true. My wife has said it a hundred times being a photographer. It's like she's a different person with everyone. And I'm not picking on her. This is her own words. Other people's kids will come to the studio and they're just acting nuts and throwing things around. And she's oh, yeah, snapping pictures. You get the Banner clan together, she's like ready to lose it. Come on, guys! What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, she doesn't sound like Mickey Mouse, though. I, I, that was me. I did that part. Um, yeah, it's just so weird, isn't it? And it, and it makes us realize that Satan wants us to think we can serve somewhere else, not right where we're at. And that's where Jesus started, right where he was at, in a foo- room full of traitors. One of them was selling them out for money, the other one was denying them three times, and all the others were running away. And Jesus said, and I'll serve you. Under their point 3B, Roman numeral lowercase 2, We must not wait for big occasions to serve God. We must use the little ones all around us. Jesus here didn't wait for another moment, did he? He used what was in front of him. And it's amazing how we'll go, and I, oh man, I love packing shoeboxes, so please don't, I'm all about that. But isn't it weird, right? You can get kids to pack shoeboxes, you can get husbands to pack shoeboxes, you can get wives to pack shoeboxes, and then you say, hey honey, will you help me uh, pack my uh, drawer in my bedroom? That's your job, that's your drawer. Take care of it. Hey, sweetheart, will you help me put the dishes away? This is your job. Go do it. Leave me alone. I'm going to go pack shoe boxes. Isn't that weird? Will you help me come weed? No, I'm not going to help you come weed. I'm going to go do shoe boxes. What? No, go help your spouse weed. Go help them fold the laundry. Go help run the vacuum. Go scratch their back. Isn't that weird? How we're so willing to jump into the big occasions, but the little ones that surround us all the time. Do you ever watch a piece of trash at a mall? Do you ever notice how every single person walks by and looks at it? And no one will pick it up. Why? That's someone else's job. Do you think that mindset plagues us in the church? Do you think that plagues us in our, our marriages? I think that plagues us in this nation. That's someone else's job. And yet right there, that piece of trash is God's will, opportunity to say, will you serve me? Ah, it hurts to bend over. I remind you, suffering is part of following me. You don't think it pained Jesus' heart to wash a guy's feet who he knew was going to sell him out? He, this guy's human. Three, we must not wait for a convenient time to serve God because the reality is that time will never come. I can be king of this, get home from work, a little tired, a little st- sometimes over, just kind of stressed out, mind's a little frazzled. Hey, Dad, will you help me with business math in a minute? And that minute never comes. <laughs> hey, honey, will you grab the trash? Give me a minute. 
That minute never comes. Hey, the Lord speaking into my soul. Hey, Aaron, will you spend some time with me this morning? In a minute. That minute never comes. Isn't that true? There's never a convenient time to serve. It just isn't. And we got to get that mindset out of our head. I'm going to wait for a convenient opportunity. I, I'm going to be part of prayer meeting when I'm not as busy. Guess what? You're never going to not be busy. This is how Satan works. He loves to work through convenience. We live in a convenience-oriented society. For crying out loud, we have things called convenience stores. And as Christians, the distinguishing mark of our service is that it's never convenient. It was not convenient for Jesus to get down and wash these people's feet. It was not convenient, but it's what God wanted him to do. Fourth point. We must serve and do what God says important, not what we or others say. We know what God says is important. Every one of us in this room, I don't need to preach it. You know it. The question is, do you do it? And in case we're muddied on this point, the book of James makes it clear. If you know the thing to do, but you don't do it, what is that called again? It's sin. And I don't say that to beat us up. I say that because Satan says, well, it's not a convenient time, so don't make it a big deal. And God's going, are you, are you blind to this? This is sin? Are you blind that you're not imitating my son Christ right now? Are you blind that you are okay with doing what you want to do rather than what I, the Lord God who bought you, who owns you, right? Last week, the other week, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. And yet I'm still doing what? Is it convenient for me? Can't work that way, church. We must Serve and do what God says is important, not what we or others say. And we have to ask ourselves, as Christ points it out here, for I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you. And here's the incredible point. is Jesus isn't kidding, is he, about this word? He's not kidding. I know many of you, and I admire many of you, and I mean this, I look up to many of you on Wednesday nights because I know it's not convenient to get here. I know it doesn't fit into your schedule. I know your nights are rushed. I know that dinners are crammed down our throats and we're running over here. I know that. And I watch you all get here, and sometimes with tears in my eyes, I say, thank you, God, for these people. And why do you keep doing it? Because you're blessed and you know it. You recognize and you're real about that struggle to get here. You feel it every week and at the end of the night you go, thank you God. Thanks for reminding me every week what a blessing it is to serve you. Was it hard? I'm not going to play around. Of course it's hard. But was it a blessing? That's why I keep doing it. Week in, week out. Jesus isn't kidding. If you don't know that example, if you're not sure that it's a blessing, I would encourage you to get out of your comfort zone and go serve God somewhere. Somehow. Make sure that it's not convenient. Make sure that it's not comfortable. Jesus isn't saying, yeah, I, 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 I did the hard road, but you do the easy road and you'll receive the blessing. No, no, no. He's saying, do as I did. Serve your Judas. Do it inconveniently. Because what we see is since Jesus did this, we must be servants, church. A quote from Charles Spurgeon says, I believe that many professing Christians are cold and uncomfortable because they are doing nothing for their Lord. But if they actively served him, their blood would begin to circulate spiritually and it would dwell and it would be well with them. And what we must realize is in the end, in Christ, we are royalty. Servanthood is our job, and intimacy with God is our power. Servanthood's the name of the game. You know, as a pastor, I have a job. The apostles in the book of Acts picked 
disciples, or excuse me, deacons, to serve the church because they said that it wasn't good for them to take time away from the study of the Word and prayer. Do you know that in 2021, would you believe that your pastor's ministry is just as much jeopardized in those two areas as it was for those disciples? Do you know that there is never a lack of opportunity to visit, to call, to conversate? Do you know what Satan is always, and I mean always, threatening? Is when I get on my knees to beg God for this church. When I walk around these buildings and cry out the name of Jesus and say, Father, hold back the spiritual forces of evil. May your Holy Spirit move in this place that we do not just hear a sermon, but we hear the Word of God. And that we leave here not merely informed people, but transformed people that yearn to glorify your name. So, Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know that that prayer walk that I do every week is threatened? Something goes wrong, the timing gets off. You know, every time I go to open the Word of God, whether it's in my personal life, preparation for a sermon, getting ready for prayer meeting, doing a TV episode, and, I, and I'm not exaggerating. Every single time the Word of God is opened, something tries to get in the way. Now, I can run up to the hospital and spend four hours up there, no problem. No, no issues, no interruptions, nothing sit in my office, calling out in the name of Jesus and saying, Father, speak to me. I want to know you. A student cannot be more fully taught than their master. And Father, if I don't know you, this church can't know you. And if I preach fluff, they'll live fluff. And if I don't devote my energy to being humbled by your word, we will not be humbled by your word. Every single week, the gates of hell break loose. If you think it's like that for me, I say that to you to realize it's the same for you. Oddly enough, being a pastor is not convenient. In fact, there's not much about it that's convenient, and I don't mind. Because it requires me to rely on the Holy Spirit to do His will. I can't be a pastor on my own. No man can. It's impossible. And I think sometimes the temptation is, well, it's easy for him. I just got to get better at it. No, church, it's hard for all of us. Because Satan can't stand the people who say, I, I will serve thee because I love thee. Because you've given life to me. The very life I'm living, the very air I'm breathing, the very actions I'm taking are only because of Jesus Christ. The person that lives that way, man, they, they can go out and they could, they could take a college class. They could play a sport. They could split logs. They could do anything. Right? People go and, and play sports all the time. The threat is not playing sports. The threat is, will I do it to the glory of God? There's where the attack comes in. Millions of people will go to work tomorrow. Where will the threat come? Father, can I walk into this classroom? Can I go into the woods? Can I go into this business office and bring glory to your name? Can I serve like Jesus? Will I serve my Judases? Will I serve my enemies? Will I bless those who curse me? Because that's what Jesus did, and that's what I'll do. There's where the distinguishment comes, doesn't it? Everyone's going to go serve tomorrow. The question is, for whom and why? And my desire for us as a church is to say, let's do it for Jesus. Let's do it like Jesus. If we're serving and we're scared that we're being taken advantage of, and you're saying, that's why I'm not going to serve, I want you, seriously, to hit the pause on the worried heart that you have and to say, Jesus, I need your help in this moment because right now I'm falling back into that rut that gave me room to not serve my enemy. And yet you, the Lord Jesus Christ, serve Judas. I need to. I am without excuse. So Father, give me your grace, give me your power, give me your spirit to serve as you served and do it seriously. To realize that when my Lord and Savior said, if you know these things, please do them. He wasn't kidding. He wasn't kidding. 
And I believe with all my heart that if we're a people that serve as Christ served, we're worried about a nation, we're worried about our communities. You know how it's all changed? Serving like Jesus. Serving in a way the world says, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with us? <laughs> Nothing. We're just living like Jesus. Our closing hymn today is a song you know. I will serve thee because I love thee. It's different than what's in your bulletin. It's 660. 660. And I want this, this psalm that Brian's going to come and lead to be a prayer. I want it to be a declaration of our desire to serve God because he has served us. To love him, to portray him without excuse in all that we do because we realize he has given life to us. Heavenly Father, this morning as we close in Psalm, I pray that your name would be glorified. I pray that we would be intentional about finding ways to serve and doing it with the attitude of Christ. Father, I, I think of the students in this room, that they can glorify you in the way that they act in their class, the way that they play their sport, the way that they serve their teammates, the way that they serve their underclassmen. Father, they have ample opportunity in the smallest of ways to live out the life of a Christian. And I just pray that you give them the encouragement, give them the faith, the courage, the humility to consider themselves less than others and consider the things of others more than significant than ourselves. And Father, I pray for us as the adults, as we go to our jobs tomorrow, as we spend time with people, I pray that we would find ways to serve that one person that just, man, a day, they get under our skin to find the smallest, littlest way to serve them. Whether it's grab them a cup of coffee, whether it's bring them a baked good, something to serve them. Father, I pray for our marriages, that we would be intentional about serving one another, that we would be better at serving close to home than we are serving away from home. And Father, that starts with me. I know that that's something I have to work on continually to serve my family by setting time aside, being intentional about time with them. Going farther for them than I would go for this church. So Lord, start with me. Start with us. Lord, may we find ways to serve this community. May we find ways to live out the testimony of Jesus in every little thing that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand. Our closing hymn today is going to be page 660 in your hymnals. I think if you know it, Bill and Gloria wrote, Gaither wrote this song, would you believe, 51 or two years ago now. But I will serve thee because I love thee. We're going to sing it through twice.
Thank you for coming this morning. God bless you.